Well, welcome everybody to our online service. We are so glad that you have joined us. We have some uh, extra special things going on today on the online service. Mm -hmm. In a second, we'll have a video um, about our Cuba team, our Catalyst Cuba team, and then uh, we'll have a scripture reading right after that. But first... As always, we have some extra fun uh, announcements for you. So uh, as a reminder, we have three identical services at 9.30 a.m., 11 a.m., and 12.30 p.m. on Sunday. And Grace Kids classes will be available for all ages at all three services. Mm -hmm. And we are excited to announce that Sign Up is now up for our three Good Friday services as well as our four Easter Sunday services. So simply just go to graceatu.org slash Easter to sign up for those services. And we're just requesting that everybody sign up to ensure that there is space and parking for everybody. Yep. There's so many things going on at GBC right now. The details on everything can be found in The Loop, which is our e-newsletter. And The Loop is the best way to stay up to date. And you may subscribe to it at graceatu.org slash loop. And then finally, we believe that giving is an act of worship. You may give online at graceatu.org slash give or by mailing your offering to our 1300 South Maple Road address. All right, well, here is our Cuba team. Living a life on mission with Jesus is one of the greatest privileges of the Christian life. We are thrilled to invite our Catalyst students here at GBC into the Great Commission and show them the joy of spreading the gospel. Sharing the gospel with one of these filters is a simple and effective way to communicate the gospel. Jesus is truly the living water that we are thirsting for. They've already been a great reminder for us of the great hope Jesus offers us. The Lord is already working in Cuba in profound ways, and we're excited to continue to both learn from the local church there, as well as partner with them on mission. Our purpose is to share the living water, that is Jesus, but at the same time, bless them with healthy water. Es eh, importante y es eh, necesario que los hermanos de Estados Unidos vengan a trabajar con nosotros aquí en la predicación del Evangelio. Porque eh, tal vez en los lugares que nosotros no llegamos o en los lugares que a nosotros no nos abren la puerta porque ya saben que somos de la iglesia, eh, sí le abren a los hermanos de Estados Unidos las puertas de los hogares y, y son bien recibidos. En nuestra comunidad. Y damos gracias a Dios porque desde el tiempo que Dios nos puso en este lugar hemos sentido la pasión de trabajar con la comunidad de una manera bien especial, no solo a través de la enseñanza bíblica, sino también a través de la demostración bíblica, del amor, de la misericordia, del cuidado. Each filter costs $40 and each student is asked to bring five filters. This is where you, the people of GBC, come in. We are asking for help purchasing a total of 135 filters. Would you help us buy filters to share the gospel in Cuba? Beyond filters, would you also consider donating to us to help make this trip possible? We are trusting God to provide and we are stepping out in faith. We are asking you to join us in helping with these needs. I'm thankful to go to a church that believes in sharing the gospel and empowering students. I can't wait to see all that God is going to do in and through us as we serve Him. First Corinthians 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, 
for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these, and to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence. For they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such men. The churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. What is a surefire sign that you've been growing up a little bit? There's lots of signs of getting older, but what are some benchmarks of really maturing in the faith? Today we're going to talk about three things, three things that let you know that you're actually making some spiritual progress. A few weeks ago, we talked about turbulence, turbulence that can happen when you are on a flight. And I mentioned that I have learned over the years to sort of focus on the flight attendants and try to gauge their reaction to see how I should be reacting to the bumps and the discomfort that I'm experiencing. Now, occasionally a flight will become so uncomfortable, so bouncy, that when the plane lands, I have been on flights where all of a sudden the whole flight starts to applaud. Now, I don't exactly know why they're applauding in those situations. Maybe they are just applauding out of a sense of relief, like, oh, thank goodness we're all alive. Or maybe they're trying to so show appreciation to the flight crew. Or maybe it's almost derision. It's like a sarcastic clap, like, thanks a lot, pilots in the heavens, for such terrible weather that we just experienced. I'm not sure why they're clapping, but they clap as a result of the plane landing. Well, today we are in chapter 16, the last and final chapter of this bumpy ride that we have called 1 Corinthians. And for some of us, maybe we feel like clapping today that we have survived this letter and learned these lessons written by the Apostle Paul to an ancient church in Greece. Now, we called our sermon series Centered because theirs was a church that was in kind of a chaotic and difficult culture for faith to grow. I mean, it was a place where anything went, where people pursued wealth and pleasure and all kinds of things to a degree where living a quiet, simple Christian life was not an easy thing to do. And the Apostle Paul, their founding pastor, wrote them this letter to try to help them to center, to focus again on who Jesus is and what Jesus had done for them. And so we've been working our way through this whole chapter, and today we land at chapter 16. Now, many of the sections that we have seen have dealt with significant problems in the church, mostly young church problems. What I mean is they're the type of problems that a bunch of immature people who haven't been around the faith for very long would experience when they first begin to gather as a family of faith. And in chapter 16, the Apostle Paul wants to give them a few more instructions. Now, to be fair, this chapter, after you've read chapter 15, which is about the resurrection, it's just such a beautiful chapter about, about that, it feels a little bit... Mm, 
I don't know, like, like topical, like there's just popcorn-y, there's all these different things to the point where one pastor I read called this the tapas chapter. It's just like all these little small plates that are being served up right as the Apostle Paul gets ready to sign off. But as we read through this chapter and we think about this chapter, I want us to approach it a bit like a parent that we're listening into a parent give final instructions to their son or daughter before they leave and send that kid off to college. You know, this parent has lovingly corrected and taught that now young adult, and they have really given them everything that they could, and, and they tried to train them up and had lots of long lectures and hard nights and tears and celebrations, but here they are in these final moments before sending the kid off to college, and they wanna give just a, just a few last sort of reminders or instructions. That's what's happening in this chapter today. Now, I remember being on the receiving end of those dad lectures. It was a few years ago. But I remember my dad speaking to me and giving me a few last warnings and instructions before he left me at school. Well, now I'm getting to the age where I'm on the other side of the equation. And let me tell you, young people, it's harder over here as a parent to, to let your kids go. But that's what the Apostle Paul is doing. So let's look just for a little while at a few things that he mentions in this last chapter, some last words that he gives to them in this dad lecture. Now, in chapter 13, we read where Paul said in verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. And so in this chapter, we see the Apostle Paul saying, hey, I also kind of want you to give up these childish ways, and I want you to now grow up in your faith and really know what it means to center your life on Christ. And so he gives us these instructions. Now, if you're somebody who um, is newer to the faith, or maybe you're just exploring the faith, sometimes when you get to chapters like this, it feels a little bit like a list of some rules or some instructions. And you can be tempted to think that maybe these are the types of things a person's supposed to do in order to earn their way into God's family. Like, if you do these three things, then God will accept you and he will love you and then you can go to heaven or something like that. But that is not the understanding that we're supposed to bring to this text. In fact, when we approach texts like this one, we are supposed to come like children who have been given everything from our God, that we've done nothing to deserve his mercy, his grace, his empowerment, his forgiveness, even eternal life. All we have to do is receive what he's offered to us. And so when we get to these instructions, we read these as corrections maybe, but certainly encouragements for what it means to walk closely with Jesus and to be part of his family, to, to live up to the name that has been given to us. So let's not think about today, again, like just some random instructions to try to earn God's favor. We cannot earn God's favor. Instead, let's listen in on this dad lecture where these kids are given some expectations for how they might live in a way that is honoring to Jesus. So let's look at Papa Paul's instructions here and let's notice three things that should mark Christians who are really growing up in their faith. Not just growing older, but growing up in their faith. Three markers of what it means to mature in Christ. Marker number one is generosity. It's generosity. This is what he says in 16 verse one. Now. Concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredited by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. So this letter, which was written by Paul, was delivered to this church, and they would gather probably in one of the members' homes who may have been wealthy to have a big enough home for everyone, and then it would be read to the entire congregation, some of whom would be wealthy, as we mentioned, and probably some of whom were not. And this whole congregation heard these instructions that when the Apostle Paul got to the end of his letter, he highlights this call to generosity that one of the markers of a person who's maturing in their faith is that they learn what it means to be truly generous. 
Specifically, he instructed them to set aside money to further the message of the gospel and help other churches and fund ministries. Look, look at some of the specific things he says. He says, on the first day of the week. This means he's asking them to give consistently. And then he says, each of you, which means he's asking all of them to give something. And then he says, put something aside as he may prosper, which means they are supposed to give proportionately. You know, the Apostle Paul knew what all of us know, which is that for most kids, sharing is not natural, right? When kids are little, they sort of mirror the seagulls in Finding Nemo, where everything is mine, 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 mine. But unfortunately, some people get older and they never lose that immaturity. In fact, as they get older, they have more and more stuff, more and more resources, but they never learn what it means to be truly generous, to address the opportunities and the problems in the world that's around them. Well, this pastor was talking to a group of people who, like us, have experienced the greatest act of generosity ever in God giving his own son to rescue us and secure for us an eternal inheritance. Now, as Jesus followers, we cannot, nor should we even try to pay back God, but we are called as we mature in faith to overflow like God's generosity to us, to overflow generously to others in, in everything. We owe Jesus everything. And most of us would agree with this. Most of us know that part of growing up, specifically growing up in the faith, means growing in generosity. But how generous are you, really? Are, are you somebody who's put childish ways behind, or are you somebody who's really grown in generosity? For some of us, I think that we define generosity as having an attitude or a spirit of willingness to give. That growing in generosity means something like praying and kind of like churning and waiting to be inspired, and once we're inspired, then being willing to give to that something. And, you know, that, that sort of makes sense for how we might think about it, but the problem is that definition of generosity is not biblical. In fact, I cannot think of a single Bible verse that says that the people of God who've experienced his generous love ought to work really hard that they might summon an enthusiastic readiness to give. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait a second, doesn't it say God loves a cheerful giver? Yeah, that's actually in 2 Corinthians. But what it doesn't say is that God loves a cheerful potential giver. See, generosity isn't about potentially giving, it's about actually giving. Generosity isn't a mere feeling. A person isn't generous actually by just feeling potentially generous. They are actually generous when they do generous things, when they give. It's almost like Paul is saying, listen, when I come to you, I don't want to like explain some new vision. I don't want to pitch some idea to you. I don't want to put a thermometer on the wall, which says, here's what we're going to do. And here's what our needs are. I don't want to do any of that. When I, when I show up or when you select some people, when they show up, I want you to have been so proportionately and consistently generous, every one of you, in setting aside money that without even saying, hey, here's what the new plan is, we will send very like upright people to carry out God's work in the world with your generosity. That's what I want you to do. Just put away, put aside childish ways and simply be, don't just feel, but be generous. Now, this calling of Paul's on this church to be generous is all over the place in the Bible. You cannot mature in faith without maturing in the arena of generosity. Now, about a year ago, we, we shared with our church that we're doing this reunion initiative, where as a church, we've been raising money to essentially double the size of our building, which will allow us to continue the ministry to the people that are here, as well as to reach others who are not yet here part of God's family. And so we are building um, a secure kids wing, an indoor playground, youth center, gym, expanding and fixing the parking lot. We're doing a number of things because our church has been growing. And we feel like God is 
asking us to keep reaching more and more people. So we've been building phase one, which if you've been on this property, you've noticed it looks like a whole bunch of dirt so far, but in this next week, we're gonna have some steel going up. And so we'll start seeing something a little bit more exciting. And then phase two is going to be building out the sanctuary into the courtyards and also finishing some of the parking, which is gonna require another couple million dollars or something like that. And we're not yet ready to do that second phase just yet, but we're coming up with other plans. Like what if we swap out some pews for some chairs? Can we get more people in the room and things like that? We're working through some of those items right now. And if you wanna hear more about the reunion initiative, um, you can check out online. There's actually a button for it where you can just click right there. But the truth is, I have at times had sort of a love-hate relationship with stuff like building projects, like this reunion initiative, for example. Like every pastor I've ever met, and maybe even Paul, there's part of me that thinks it would be so amazing to be part of a church that was so consistently, proportionally generous to every last person that we never had to put together fancy promo videos or brochures, or pitch visions to people, but that whenever something happened where we felt like the nudge of God, that the pastor's elders could get together and just go, oh, look at that, the money's already there. So like when Pastor Adam and I met with two different pastors from other churches last week, and they said, we're ready right now to plant a church, we could say, oh, here's $50,000 right now, let's get rolling on those church plants. Or if Hope Clinic should come to us and say, hey, we're looking to buy this new, really expensive medical equipment. We'd say, oh, look, there's a hundred grand just sitting right there. Let's just, let's just get that stuff for you right now. Or when we're looking at chairs instead of pews, we could say, we don't have to do any of that research. Look, there's $2 million just sitting right there. Just go ahead and expand the sanctuary so people can fit. Like most pastors, it would be amazing to think that generosity of people was so consistently significant that the funds always exceeded the needs and even the dreams. So sometimes I get a little remiss talking about building projects and here's this new big thing that we're gonna do. But here's what I like about talking about a building project or raising funds for something like this. These moments are opportunities for us to be reminded that first of all, we have everything we could ever need in Jesus. And then secondly, that he has given us so much, that he invites us to be part of what he's doing in the world. So as much as at times this feels awkward to talk about, it's also kind of awesome that we can share with each other specific needs and say, hey, we need to be reminded that our futures are ultimately not secured by a retirement account, and our identities are not found in a number, and that our God is not done working in this area, but he's still at work and we get to be part of it. It's, it's a little bit like a dad telling his college student, listen, I've paid for your entire education. You don't have to worry about that. I've gotten you the meal plan. It's 21 meals a week, so don't, you don't even have to worry about going out on the weekends. I'm gonna deposit $500 every month in your account for incidentals. Now, here's what I want you to do, son. I just want you to be generous with those around you that have needs because you have enough. And so as I read this, where the Apostle Paul is encouraging them to grow up in this arena, again, there's part of me that's a little resistant to talking about money stuff specifically, but this is an opportunity to keep growing in our faith by growing in the arena of actual generosity. So how generous are you? And what might be another step in that process? So that's, that's the first benchmark that he talks about here in chapter 16. The second benchmark, comes up a few verses later, and it's the marker of availability. Availability. How available are you to the plans and the work of God and being led by his Holy Spirit? I, I actually love this next section of the chapter because so many of us believe that a spiritually mature person pretty much always knows what God is gonna ask them to do. And they just have their plans figured out and they just chart their course and they get in their prayer closet every day, just boom, 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 everything just works out really smoothly. And I love these texts because sometimes that might happen where God makes his plan very, very clear to us in the path that we're supposed to walk. But often it's very difficult to know what God might be asking of us. In fact, it is possible to be in the dead center of the will of God deeply devoted to Jesus, 
biblically thoughtful, incredibly spiritually mature, and still not be entirely sure where you're supposed to go next. Do you know how I can say this? Because if there was ever a person who was biblically thoughtful, spiritually mature, who was clearly in the center of God's will, it would have been the Apostle Paul. And he was, at this time, writing Bible, so he's definitely in the center of God's will. Yet look at what he says in these verses. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, verse 5, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Did you, did you notice his language here? He says, I will, I intend, perhaps, or maybe, I hope, if the Lord permits. He's incredibly uncertain about what exactly is going to come next. And I find this incredibly reassuring. He does say, hey, here are my plans. I would like to do this, but I, I'm not sure how this is all going to shake out. For now, it seems God's given me this opportunity for effective work where I am. But of course, if there's effective work going on, there's also some opposition that's going on. And so he says, listen, just be ready. Be available to what God is going to do. And if God should bring these folks along to you, be ready to receive Timothy and Apollos and Paul says, and me, if things should work out the way that I want. There is a fluidity to the life of the Spirit, isn't there? In many cases, we do not and cannot know what is happening next. Our job is to make ourselves available. Now, here, available means by, that we are called to be hospitable. We talked about this not too long ago, but every one of us who's a Jesus follower has been challenged and called and encouraged in multiple places in the Bible to open up our lives to others, to be truly hospitable, to welcome folks to the table with us, to share our time and our homes and food with somebody else, being available to be used by God in their lives. I was talking to an engaged GBC couple the other day. We were doing premarital counseling, and I had asked them a little bit about their upcoming wedding ceremony. And I said, you know, how do you anticipate that going? Are there any specific things that you want to have happen? And they looked at me and they said, you know what, the only thing we care about for the ceremony is that people know how clearly and deeply loved that they are by God and that we want God to use our marriage to share that message with others. That's all we care about. Isn't that amazing? They had this spirit of availability, of hospitality, this desire to be used by God in other people's lives. Now, when we're younger, we might not think that much about the power of a shared meal and how the Holy Spirit can use that. But as we grow, we become more and more available when we become more and more hospitable. And that's the first thing that he's really challenging them to do in terms of availability here. But beyond hospitality, there is another type of availability that Paul demonstrates in his own planning. He knows that he has this opportunity where he is, but that there's also opposition. That sometimes those two things go hand in hand. And yet he has this sort of, here I am, send me spirit. He has this sort of, God, just tell me what to do and I'll go. If you open up a door, I'm going to go there. Do we have that same sort of spirit that is willing to be used and led by God wherever he might take us? You know, I wonder if some of us have carved out such comfortable lives for ourselves that we fear being totally available to God because he might mess up our plans. So are we seeking God's wisdom and leaning into and learning from his word? Are we really spending time in silence so that we can hear the whispers of God? The question is, how available are we? Because as we grow in Christ, we are to become more and more available and, and led by his spirit. One of the ways I've been challenged to become more available is in, in carving out real time for silence. Because 
my ears, my mind is constantly clogged with noise, with arguments and, and screens and podcasts and all kinds of stuff. And sometimes it makes it so that I'm not available to really hear or be led or nudged by the Spirit. And I have been trying to find more time where I'm just silent before God, where I can really meditate on His Word and sense His nudge. I recently saw a meme that I thought was fairly on point years ago. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Screwtape Letters, which was written as if this older demon, this uncle demon named Screwtape, was writing to his nephew named Wormtail, and he was sharing some thoughts with Wormtail, and here's how you mess up Christians. And so I saw this meme where somebody used that sort of framing of screw tape and Wormtail, and they wrote this instead, and I thought this was so good. It said, my dear Wormwood, disregard everything I wrote in my previous letters. Just get your patient to download TikTok, and it will do all the work for us, your affectionate uncle screw tape. And when I saw that, I thought, wow, that is just perfectly accurate because many of us are not particularly available to be led by God because we're constantly distracted by everything else. We might read God's word, but then we don't give ourselves time to really meditate and think about it and allow it to shape us and to guide us. We don't spend hardly any time in silent prayer, just sort of walking and listening. And so we might say we want to be available, but we don't put ourselves in positions to be available and to hear. I was reading a story of a man named Charles Simeon, who was a pastor in England for about 50 years, late 1700s to early 1800s. And he faced all kinds of incredible difficulties, even with his own congregation, where people would lock their pews. I guess there were like little gates or doors on the ends to not let other people in. Where local university students would wait outside the church to try to mug him and beat him up. I mean, he faced a lot of difficulty. And one of his friends had written to him and asked him how he could face such opposition and such difficulty and do so with such an open spirit. And he wrote this. He said, my dear brother, we must not mind a little suffering for Christ's sake. When I'm getting through a hedge, if my head and shoulders are safely through, I can bear the pricking of my legs. Let us rejoice in the remembrance that our holy head has surmounted all his suffering and triumphed over death. Let us follow him patiently. We shall soon be partakers of his victory. Now, when you know more of Charles Simeon's story, you realize that with all of that difficulty he faced, the one thing that he did over and over again was make himself available to the Spirit, to have a hospitable heart and home and life, even when others were trying to shut him out, to, to continually listen to God in silence and be led by him. He was available more and more as he aged in the faith. How available are we? Do you have your whole life figured out? If so, that's awesome. That's awesome that you do. But are you willing to say, God, here's my plan. I submit it to you. Lead me where I need to be. Are, are, are you somebody who is more hospitable now than you were five years ago? Are you able to listen and sit in silence more now than you were five years ago? As we are growing up, are we really growing up in this availability? So the first mark of spiritual maturity, putting childish ways behind, is growing in actual generosity, not just potential generosity. The second mark here is that we're growing in our availability to the leading of the Spirit. And then there's a third marker here as well. And the third marker is the marker of boldness. Check out verse 13. It says this, Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Act like men. Sound your barbaric yelp from the mountaintops. Cue up the angry heavy metal intro for the Dude Podcast. Tune into the musings of some ridiculous masculine guru wannabe. Dress like a lumberjack. Act like a man is what the Apostle Paul tells us here. Only kind of. So just relax a little bit. Here's what he said. Now, the Apostle Paul does see differences between men and women. We've talked about this in some of the chapters past in terms of roles in the church and in their homes and how they ought to dress. And so he has no problem saying, men, this is how you're supposed to re react and respond. Ladies, this is what you're supposed to do. He has no problem seeing those differences. But this phrase, act like men, 
it, that's not a wrong translation of it, but it's just one translation. There are other versions who have looked at that phrase, act like men, and they've translated it differently. So look at a couple of these other translations. The NIV says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. The New King James says, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. The Old King James says, watch ye, steadfast in the faith, Quit you like men, be strong. I have no idea what quit you like men means, but that sounds kind of fun. Uh, the message says, keep your eyes open, hold tight to your convictions, give it all you got, be resolute, love without stopping. The RSV says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, yada, yada, yada. Th this brings us to the Bible Nerd Moment of the Day. Bible Nerd Moment of the Day. The word here is andrizomai, andrizomai. And it does mean to act like men, or to act full-grown, or to act mature, or to be responsible and courageous like an adult as opposed to like a child. So yes, this word is connected to the word for man, but it also has a connection to this idea of being mature and bold like an adult is supposed to be versus how a child's supposed to be. And so because the Apostle Paul is writing this to an entire church, is he really trying to beat up on the men in the room? Well, maybe. Maybe they needed to step their game up. But I think that another possibility that's very legitimate here is that he's asking all of them to keep growing up in the faith and to set aside their childishness and to act more responsible, more, more courageous like an adult than like a scared little child. And this sort of maturity means being alert. That's the first part of his phrase. It means recognizing threats and then being lovingly brave for one another to protect each other. Perhaps in the same way that sharing isn't natural and, and that you don't just become more generous as you age without something else happening to you, boldness also isn't necessarily natural. In fact, for many of us, as we get older, we actually get less bold. We get more frightened by things. We feel more vulnerable in a lot of ways. We see more dangers because we've been around this old world a little bit longer. And so for some of us, as we get older, we're not actually getting bolder. We're, we're becoming more and more anxious and afraid. And the Apostle Paul here is saying, listen, the church needs mature, courageous Jesus followers. Pastor Regan shared with me an article about two college wrestlers who had been walking in the woods when one of them was attacked by a grizzly bear. And the one guy who wasn't attacked saw his friend getting attacked about 30 yards away. And he said he tried to get the bear to get off of his friend by shouting and throwing sticks and rocks at the bear. And he said he was like, I could run to my own safety. I could run to call for help or I can try to help my friend right now because if I just leave, he is going to die. And so what he did was he just ran and he literally jumped onto the back of this raging grizzly bear and grabbed it by the fur and wrestled it off of his friend. Well, what came next was an absolutely brutal attack by the bear that nearly ended his life. And you can read the article yourself. It's, it's powerful and it's brutal and it's, it's rough, but in the end, it was this brilliant picture of this young man showing such bravery in the face of almost certain death in order to protect his friend. We are called to be brave for one another, to stand up and be courageous in sharing our faith and looking out for each other. And those of us who are getting on in years that we've walked with Jesus for a decade or almost five, those of us who are getting a little bit older and more mature in the faith ought to be growing in our boldness and in our courage. You know, the young people that are around us, they don't need to see a bunch of scared adults. That's not helpful to them. They don't need to see us in our 60s and 70s and 80s not talking about our faith, not saying, yes, I'm going to be dying here, but my future is held secure in Christ. They don't need us to freak them out about like what's going on in the world. They don't need that. They need us to have a resolute courage. And the Apostle Paul calls on them to, yes, be alert. Like have your eyes open, understand things, but 
Be bold and courageous. Act like grown-ups, not like children. Just do it in a loving way. Now, these markers of, of growing in the faith, these things, do these things just happen in everyone? Well, no. They happen in the person that gets so captivated by the work of Jesus and his empty tomb. For, for the person who, who has read chapter 15 in the reality of the resurrection, chapter 16 almost becomes easy because the empty tomb is the thing that empowers us to be truly generous and available and bold. And so, yes, these are things that maybe are challenging all of us. Oh, maybe I need to be more generous, actually generous. Maybe I need to be available and not just so committed to my own plans. Maybe there's some arenas where I need to have greater boldness. We should look at ourselves in the mirror and pray about those things. But let's, as a close, look at just a couple of verses from chapter 15 to once again empower us to actually take these strides. This is what it says in verse 54. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen.